All right, thanks everyone for coming. I just got off an airplane from Canada like three hours ago, so we'll see how, uh, how this all goes this, uh, this afternoon here. Um, thanks so much for inviting me to uh, this symposium. This is my first time at uh, this particular conference, and it's really nice to be back in Bristol again and talking about weapons. Uh, before I get started into uh, dinosaur weapons, I just want to do a little bit of a plug for my new position at the Royal BC Museum in scenic Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. Um, we don't have very many dinosaurs yet, but uh, we do have a really fabulous but somewhat underutilized collection of invertebrate fossils. So if anyone here is really interested in marine invertebrates from the Cretaceous of the Pacific coast of North America or Eocene insects and plants, please come and talk to me at some point during the conference because um, I'd like to see our collection used a little bit more. All right, let's get on to weapons then. Um, so weapons are a really ubiquitous adaptation in the animal kingdom. They're found uh, in dinosaurs, which is what I'm mostly going to talk about today, but they occur across many different clades and have evolved independently many different times in mammals and reptiles and birds even, and obviously many, many times in insects and invertebrates. Um, they take many different forms, but there do seem to be a few underlying selective pressures that are common to the appearance of this particular feature. And in particular, weapons tend to evolve when animals need to guard something. So either a food resource or territory or even mates themselves, and it's usually related to reproduction. So you get this wonderful diversity of form, um, but usually related to this sort of one particular ecological factor. So what you might have seen in that previous slide is that cranial weaponry, or at least weapons sort of towards the front of your body, are really, really common. Weapons on the other side of your body, on your tail, are very rare. Um, most animals fight face to face, so it's probably not surprising that you get weapons towards the front of the body. Um, but I also think that there's a lot of risks associated with that. That's where like your brain and your mouth and your eyes are all these sort of important parts of your anatomy. In contrast, it's not really so bad if something bad happens to your tail while, fa while fighting. And yet it's not a feature that really appears very often in the fossil record. There's a couple examples like ankylosaurs, which I will talk about for most of this talk, um, and a couple other examples in sauropods, stegosaurs, and maybe even some turtles, and the uh, glyptodonts. But it's a relatively rare adaptation. Um, so what I want to talk about for this particular um, presentation is focused mostly on tail weaponry, but a lot of these questions can be applied to studying weapons uh, on the head or other parts of the body in the fossil record as well. And I want to talk about how we identify features as weapons, how we can approach studying uh, when and how they evolved, and how we can try to tackle questions about why they evolved in the first place, why questions are always really hard in paleontology. So that one's still a little bit up in the air. So I think one thing that's really important when we're talking about weaponry in the fossil record is trying to figure out whether or not that structure actually could be used as a weapon. Um, so while something that evolves for display doesn't really need necessarily to have to have any mechanical, um, uh, doesn't have to sort of mechanically perform at some sort of optimal level, a weapon does. Um, so if a weapon breaks when it's used in combat, it's probably not really being used as a weapon. Uh, so the first work that I did uh, as a grad student was basically tackling this particular problem, which is are ankylosaur tail clubs actually tail clubs? Um, we sort of say it right in the name, but could they actually use them that way? So ankylosaur tail clubs are really interesting structures that don't have a very uh, similar analog in, in many other animals uh, ever in the fossil record. Uh, ankylosaurs have regular caudal vertebrae at the front of their tail that can flex around each other just like in any other dinosaur. But then the back half of the tail uh, has highly modified caudal vertebrae where the bones lock together. It gets this very characteristic sort of interlocking V pattern when you look at it from dorsal view. And ankylosaurs, of course, are covered in bony osteoderms all over their body, which usually take the form of sort of um, sort of keeled plates and big spikes, but at the tip of the tail it gets enveloped in these large knob osteoderms, which are really, really huge compared to the rest of the ones on the body. So it's kind of this two-part structure. So some of the ways that we can tackle looking at whether or not a structure is used as a weapon is we can ask, uh, can that structure actually impart enough force to cause damage like pain or maybe break other bones. Um, and so some of the work that I did was looking at um, the anatomy of ankylosaur hips and tails, um, trying to make some guesses about soft tissues of the muscles that swing the tail from side to side. 
um, and how the muscles running down the tail could flex it from side to side, looking at things like range of motion. And if you can collect all of that information together, you can look at things like rotational inertia, and you can do calculus and figure out your impact velocity, impact force, and impact pressure. And uh, it turns out that ankylosaurs could swing their tails with a lot of force, which is probably not too surprising. They're really large animals. Um, and so just moving a tail from side to side is gonna impact uh, with, with more force than say if we were like punching something. Uh, but they actually were able to impact with enough force to break a bone in under shear conditions. Um, and this is just a fun comparison where if you got hit with a baseball bat, uh, it still would have nothing on getting whomped by the tail club of something like Zool, which is like a six meter long ankylosaur. So, and even someone who's punching really, really hard is only uh, impacting with about 2,000 newtons of force. So ankylosaurs were good at smashing things, but if they smash their tail into something and the tail breaks, it's probably not being used as a weapon. So the second part of that particular line of reasoning is what happens to the tail club during those impacts. And for that, we turn to things like finite element analyses, uh, which have been used by many paleontologists to answer many different kinds of questions. Uh, lots of studies on, say, the bite mechanics of um, large predators. We can use it for looking at tail club impacts as well. So we get our digital models of um, ankylosaur tail clubs. In this case, I CT scan several, but this might actually be a little bit easier now with the advent of photogrammetry. Uh, you get your digital model into the computer, you turn it into a series of basically Lego bricks, and you apply forces and material properties to those models. And uh, then the computer can tell you what's happening to those structures under those load conditions. So what I was able to find was that, for the most part, tail clubs probably wouldn't break under the impact forces that we estimated. Um, a few scenarios where we had really, really high impact forces on the very largest tail clubs might have broken them, uh, especially if they had sort of a missed hit uh, along the handle instead of right on the tail club knob. But under most scenarios that we did, uh, that we tested, tail clubs are not going to break under impact forces. So, Together, we can say that um, if they can impact with a lot of force and withstand those forces, they probably could be used as weapons. And so I think identifying these structures as weapons is, is fairly plausible. So with that out of the way, I wanted to know a little bit more about how tail clubs have evolved and how tail weapons in general are evolving. And so that's some of the work that I've been doing more recently uh, with my colleague, Lindsay Zano. Um, we published a paper earlier this year looking at the evolution of tail weaponization across amniotes. And what we did was we looked at um, a couple of different aspects of bony tail weaponry, things like having that stiff tail and expanded tail tip, or having things like really large bony spikes like in Stegosaurus. And we uh, used basically Pagel's correlation methods um, using the, uh, the software program Discrete to take a look at how those might correlate with animals that actually use the tail as a weapon today and see if there's any things that are kind of shared between these two, um, these sort of extant behaviors and extinct morphologies. Um, it's interesting because there's actually very few animals that really do use the tail regularly as a weapon even today. Um, there aren't really any animals that have really specialized tail weaponry that's bony. Um, there's lots of lizards that are spiky, but there's also lizards that use their tail that just sort of use it as a whip. Uh, if anyone's ever had a pet iguana or knows anyone with one, they are not very nice and will use their tails and can draw blood, I'm told. Um, but it's, it's not a very common behavior and it's sort of a behavior of last resort, really. Um, but what we did find was that using these correlation methods, there is a sort of suite of characters that seems to be correlated between using the tail as a weapon and having some sort of bony tail weaponry. Um, and that includes having armor somewhere on your body, um, being relatively large and being herbivorous. Um, so these are very broad general categories, um, but it sort of points to why tail weaponry might be really rare in the fossil record because large armored herbivores are not very common today or in the fossil record. So bony tail weaponry might really be constrained by, by the things that constrain large body size and armor, for example. So that sort of opens up a whole new line of questions. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to know a little bit more about was the actual um, pattern of trait accrual in ankylosaur tail clubs. Um, and so this involves really just sort of digging into the record, doing things like ancestral state reconstruction, and trying to see how and when tail clubs first appeared. 
tail club is composed of those sort of two mechanical parts, the stiff handle and the expanded tail tip called the knob. Um, do the, both of those things appear at the same time in the fossil record, or does one predate the other, and when do those things happen? Um, so that was some of the work that I did during my PhD thesis, and for the most part, ankylosaurs with a full tail club, so stiff handle and expanded tail tip, are found pretty much at the end of the late Cretaceous um, in the last sort of 10 million years. That's probably a quirk of the fossil record. Uh, ankylosaurs as a whole, as, a, as the clade ankylosauria, start with flexible tails and then ankylosaurines get tail clubs and notosaurids retain flexible tails. And so ankylosaurs with flexible tails are found throughout, but especially early in the, uh, in the Jurassic and the early Cretaceous. But there is a period of time where there are a few species of ankylosaurs that have stiff tails, but don't have that expanded knob at the end of the tail, which I find very interesting. Um, and so those occur in the mid-Cretaceous. So it seems that there was probably a sort of two-step process to ankylosaurs evolving the full tail club morphology. There was a period of time where having a stiff tail, like a baseball bat, uh, was, was, uh, was a morphology that you could have without having that expanded tip at the end of the tail. Um, so this is very interesting. It sort of makes sense when you think about it because having a very large pull of bone at the end of a flexible tail might not really make a lot of mechanical sense. So what we might be looking at here is um, that, that having that stiff tail was an adaptation that had to be in place before you could have um, expansion of the tail tip and having all of that weight held far away from your body. What was really fun was that earlier this year, um, there was a new paper published by uh, Zhang et al. Called, on a new dinosaur called Jinyan Pelta, and that actually helped pull back the earliest date for an ankylosaur with a tail club knob. Um, so now there's a little bit of overlap, mostly because there's a bunch of stratigraphic uncertainty around ankylosaurs from China, which is where all of these mid-Cretaceous ones uh, with um, stiff-tailed and, uh, and Jinyan Pelta's tail club knob are found. Um, but that's really good. So we're starting to like close the gap in the fossil record a bit. What's also really interesting is there doesn't really seem to be a pattern in uh, how the tail club knob size changes through time because Jinyan Pelta is the earliest one and has one of the largest tail club knobs in the whole fossil record. So there's some really interesting stories to tell there. Uh, so we've got a little bit of an idea now about how ankylosaurs got their tail clubs. And I was curious to see how that compared with the closest uh, analogs in the fossil record, the glyptodonts. So of course, glyptodonts are basically giant armadillos that went extinct during the Ice Age, uh, the last Ice Age. Um, like ankylosaurs, they're also herbivores, they're heavily armored. Um, and some of them evolve a stiff tail with an expanded tail tip, a tail club. Um, but how similar are they really in terms of sort of morphospace occupation? So uh, Lindsay and I took the characters that we had tested earlier this year in our tail weaponization paper, um, which were all, were all discrete characters. We turned them into quantitative continuous characters um, to see really how similar ankylosaurs and glyptodonts really were in terms of their armor morphology um, and their tail morphology. And it turns out that they, they really do occupy a similar area of morphospace when we're looking at the traits that we looked at. Um, and we can use new R packages that help test the strength and significance of convergent evolution. In, partic in particular, Staten's Convival package um, lets you do significance testing and strength of convergence testing. And what we found was that evolution has closed about 80% of the distance uh, along those two lineages. Uh, and it's, it's a, it's a, they're significantly convergent, so they're more similar to each other than you'd expect just from like Brownian evolution and chance. So it's really fun. So we can actually start to test um, how strongly convergent weaponry actually is in the fossil record. Um, and I was also interested in whether the pattern of trait accrual in ankylosaurs and glyptodonts was similar. So did ankylosaurs, or sorry, did glyptodonts go through that same two-step process um, in tail club acquisition as ankylosaurs? And are there any other things associated with tail weaponry that follow a similar pattern? And this is relatively simple. Again, this is just sort of mapping traits onto the phylogeny using ancestral state reconstruction, and then using rank concordance analysis um, to test whether or not the pattern of accrual is significant. 
And so the acquisition of traits in ankylosaurs and glyptodons isn't identical, but it's similar enough to be statistically significant, which is really interesting. So in both clades, um, things like herbivory and body armor and large body size appear before stiffening of the thoracic region, another trait that seems to be correlated with bony tail weaponry. And stiffening of the thoracic region precedes stiffening of the distal tail, and stiffening of the distal tail precedes expansion of the tail tip. So there's some interesting things here going on with stiffening your body that seems to be related to having this weapon on your tail. Um, so again, opening up some new questions to look into in that sort of functional morphology line of research on um, why you would stiffen your body and why that seems to happen before tail weaponry occurs. Okay, and then the hardest question to answer or to ask really um, in, it, with the fossil record is why did something happen? So this is something I've been looking at lately, which is why do ankylosaurs have tail cubs at all? So, and you can really ask this question for anything, why does it have a weapon? Um, and if you pull the general public, or if we went home and looked at any of our sort of dinosaur books, like picture books for kids, you would probably find that ankylosaurs are almost always shown uh, using their tail clubs to fight tyrannosaurs, basically. Um, and in fact, you will actually find them fighting things like Godzilla, dinosaurs they don't live with, and humans. <laughs> before you see them shown fighting another ankylosaur. And if you think back to what, by the very beginning of my presentation, uh, most animal weapons have evolved for intraspecific combat. And so I think it's really interesting that we don't really tend to approach um, questions around tail weaponry the same way as other weapons. I am also guilty of this because I did name a dinosaur last year called the Destroyer of Shins, which is explicitly in reference to um, the uh, Tyrannosaur ankylosaur uh, fight that's often illustrated. But I wonder if we're actually looking at something more like this as the general function and sort of driving selective pressure for tail clubs having evolved in the first place. Are tail clubs really anti-predator defenses or are they weapons of intraspecific combat? And how can we test that and actually tease those things apart um, using very little evidence? So I think that we can actually make some hypotheses that we can uh, have quantifiable variables for and actually maybe do some significance testing. We can ask questions like if, um, if the weapon is evolving in response to predation, some aspect of that weapon should vary with some aspect of the predator that it's being used against. So we could do things like does tail club knob size vary with the body mass of the apex predator or maybe specifically tyrannosaurs. Maybe it varies with the number of predators in the ecosystem. Ecosystem. So the trick is trying to find out how we can actually quantify some of these traits um, when we don't have a whole lot of data at hand. So from what I've been able to uh, sort of plot out so far, um, it looks like there isn't really any correlation between any aspect of ankylosaur tail club morphology and the predators in their environments. But uh, if you look at my n there, n equals six in terms of the actual number of data points where there's data for a theropod and data for a tyran or um, an ankylosaur where we can actually correlate these two things. Um, so we, there doesn't really seem to be any sort of particular pattern with ankylosaur knob size evolution and any aspect of the theropod or predators in their environments. Um, which might lead us to think that uh, tail club evolution isn't influenced by predation and that tail clubs weren't anti-predator defenses. But I think it's really important to keep in mind that there is a lot of missing data. We have almost no data uh, for um, predators in the environments of the earliest uh, ankylosaurs with stiff tail clubs or stiff tails, so not necessarily the full tail club, but that kind of transitional morphology. Um, it's also possible that we're sort of asking the wrong question, so maybe simply having a stiff tail is a good enough weapon against a predator, and then the size of the knob has nothing to do with predators. Um, or we really could draw the, the conclusion that tail club evolution isn't introduced by, or isn't influenced by predation. Um, so these are just some of the approaches for tackling this question. Again, I think that you can use similar approaches for looking at the evolution of weapons and uh, whether or not they're intraspecific weapons um, or anti-predator defenses for cranial weapons or for other groups. Um, and it might actually be easier to answer some of those questions uh, in groups that have a better fossil record.
So that's just a brief overview, um, specifically <laughs> focused around ankylosaurs, but really just uh, ways to approach studying weapons in the fossil record and in dinosaurs, uh, using functional morphology and biomechanics to test whether or not it is a weapon, using things like correlation analyses and uh, tests of the pattern of trait accrual and strength of convergence for looking at when and how weaponry evolves and then trying to figure out the best way to actually test why weapons have evolved in the fossil record. Um, so that brings me to the end of this particular presentation. If you happen to be in Toronto starting tomorrow, which you will not be because you are here, um, through May, and you'd like to see a little bit more of some of this research in action, a lot of this is summarized in the exhibit that I co-curated while I was at the Royal Ontario Museum uh, called Zool, Life of an Armored Dinosaur. So if you're interested in weaponry and armor and ankylosaurs and you're in Toronto, you should check it out. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, either here or later. So thanks very much. <laughs>